Um, we're, we're talking about nutrients. This is a list of all the, the nutrients that plants need. They cannot do without these. So yeah, well, unless of course the ones between brackets. The macronutrients, those are the nutrients that the plants need quite a lot of. Uh, ammonia, not really necessary, but it helps in some conditions. Potassium, calcium, magnesium, nitrate, phosphate, sulfate, chloride, not really necessary, but it improves taste. Uh, for instance, in tomatoes. Yeah, was it proven? I mean, they did some organic research about yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it increase, uh, it increases flavor. Uh, yeah. And then the micro micronutrients or the micro elements, those are needed in very small uh, amounts, but they are uh, definitely uh, necessary for the plants. Iron, manganese, zinc, boron, copper, and molybdenum. <laughs> um, I didn't put any figures next to it because it's different for every plant species. Yeah. And um, <coughs> oh, yeah, that's a <laughs> that's an intermediate uh, picture. <laughs> that's an intermediate picture. I was just uh, going to say that if you have a nutrient solution or uh, aquaculture wastewater. Usually, those things will be in, in the wastewater in a certain concentration. And plants are quite selective in what they, they take up from the water. So they will take up what they need. Does it depend but, on the plant stage as well? You know, yeah, definitely. Okay. definitely. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I have a slide in, in, uh, in that about this topic, but for instance, uh, potassium uptake is increased dramatically when head formation in lettuce starts or when uh, fruit coloring in, in tomatoes uh, starts. That's one of the examples where you have few uptake of potassium in the beginning and once that growing stage is reached it, it increases really dramatically. Um, but what I wanted to, to show with this picture is you have your nutrients present in a, in a certain, uh, uh, at a certain level but you need to keep on recirculating this nutrient solution. You have to keep on recycling it because you don't want to uh, discharge it to the environment because what will happen? You will create a eutrophic uh, environment in, in uh, surface water. You get algal blooms. They use up a lot of oxygen during the night because of the respiration process that I, I talked to you about earlier. And you will get massive losses of, of uh, of fish, of all the animals in the water, so well, that's probably a situation that you're well aware of. I don't have to elaborate on this. But when you keep on recycling this nutrient solution, and the plants will keep taking up the nutrients that they need in, in a certain uh, proportion, you will eventually get imbalance, imbalances if your nutrient solution isn't properly, uh, properly balanced to begin with. And this will lead uh, to accumulation and depletion of certain nutrients, and that will lead to disorders. So, um, we, I, I often have a discussion about, yeah, well, I never see these imbalances, or I never see uh, deficiencies in my backyard aquaponic system. It is possible, for instance, if you only grow during the summer, from the month of May until October, let's say. You keep recycling that water, and then you say, okay, now I'm going to drain my entire system because it's going to be winter, otherwise it will be frozen, I cannot heat the greenhouse. Um, and then you empty the complete system, all the water is taken out, and at the beginning of next year, uh, in May, you will start again with clean water. Then you never get this real depletion of certain elements and the real accumulation. But if you're in a professional system where you keep on recycling the water for years and years and years, you will run into problems, for sure. But you usually change uh, maybe 10% of water weekly or monthly to do one thing that... No. <coughs> yeah. You? 
you know, you said that you change the water, but you can still have the accumulation, which are the biggest, yeah. the biggest problems. Uh, yeah. Potassium and which other elements like problematic. Which ones are? Yeah, uh, except potassium. Yeah, mostly sodium. It's not. Yeah, it's it's not, not, it's not, not uh, it's, there's a lot in the fish bin. Yeah. But, but that's one thing that we don't do in uh, in normal hydroponic system yeah. is, is change water. The only thing that takes out water is transpiration it's of the, the plants. Same aquaponics, actually. It's it's the same aquaponics. Yeah, it's the same in aquaponics. So you will definitely get depletion of some things and, and accumulation of other things. Now, um, and what do you think about the strategy to during six months to have some, uh, for example, uh, cyprinid or tilapia fish with a uh, with a uh, hot water or, uh, in hot water yeah. and, and during the six during the six months in the winter time to have a different species and different uh, plant production and keeping the water in, in the same, same water. water. Yeah, it depends on the uptake of the plants and, and what's in the fish feed. I suppose in theory you would be able to balance it. And you would be able to balance it, but then you need a lot of figures about the composition of your wastewater, what the plants are taking up. I, I don't have a, a recipe ready for you. Um, if yeah, I already told every plant species, even every variety, uh, of a certain species has a different nutrient uptake pattern also uh, depending on the growth stage a lot of research was done on that by two Dutch guys from Wageningen University Kees uh, Sonneveld and Wim Vogt they published all of these <coughs> optimal nutrient solutions for a, a lot of different crops well, all important uh, crops uh, they have several publications, this is one of their la last, uh, Plant Nutrition of Greenhouse Crops and it, it contains a lot of information about uh, running hydroponic systems, uh, nutrient management and, uh, and all of these recipes for, um, for the proper, proper nutrient solutions are in there. So use the proper nutrient solution uh, for your crops but what's important is you keep also monitoring these levels and if you're monitoring them, if you monitor them, adjust them because it also depends on, on the climate um, and especially if you're growing several different uh, vegetable species in the same system yeah, it will be very hard in the beginning to, uh, to choose a recipe that, that will be optimal. So you have to monitor the levels uh, by chemical analysis, let's say, or by uh, or chemical analysis of the nutrient solution or chemical analysis of the, the juices of the, of the leaves. This is a slide I added because recently there was a series of webinars given by uh, Professor Leo Marcelis from Wageningen University and those webinars are on nutrient solutions for hydroponic systems. They are still on YouTube, uh, different topics, They're very interesting and uh, I think they are about half an hour each. He can explain it much better than I can so I would advise you that you take your time and, uh, and have a look at those. Uh, I will supply the presentation of course afterwards as, uh, as a PDF. Uh, an example of a chemical analysis of the, the nutrient solution, so all the elements that are needed are in there. Um, a different thing that we often do in our research station is look at the leaf sap to see what's in there. We have analyzers for uh, nitrate and for potassium levels and that gives you a good idea of what the plant can take up and can use for growth at that moment because it's not because uh, certain elements are present near the roots that they also can be taken up um, this gives you a good hint yeah? Um, yeah especially for crops like if you're growing a special crop um, that, that's not grown in, in, in a lot of professional greenhouses 
uh, the, there will be no known optimal nutrient solution. So then it's very important to have analysis of the nutrient solution. And also what's the most important is to look at evolution of nutrient levels. If you see that you start with a certain recipe for your nutrient solution and uh, nitrate levels are, are decreasing and for instance calcium levels are increasing then you know that you have to supply a little bit less nitrate and uh, a little bit more nitrate and a little bit less calcium for instance. So have a look at how these things are uh, evolving, not just one measurement, one photograph, now you have to have a look at how it's going. Um, an overview of different deficiencies in, uh, in a plant, different deficiencies of certain elements uh, have, uh, have a different image, different symptoms in the plant. All, <clears throat> there are hundreds of websites on the internet uh, stating all of these uh, different deficiencies. I also added a couple of pictures uh, that I took myself uh, in the video. They will be in the next slides. Um, the, the major things or the major differences are between the nutrients that are mobile in the plant so when the plant uh, needs those nutrients for new growth and it cannot take them up by its root, it will extract them from the older leaves. So those symptoms you will see in the older leaves. The immobile elements, they remain in the older leaves. They are, they are locked there, let's say. And the plant cannot use it for the new growth and those symptoms you will see in the, in the head of the plant, in the younger leaves. Here's a, a typical thing that you might see in an aquaponic setup. It's uh, iron deficiency. Here we were growing kale in our uh, mobile gully system. There you see the typically uh, white young leaves. A boron deficiency in broccoli. Uh, you don't see it on the outside, but here you will have um, cells collapsing and you get bacterial growth on that and then after a while your entire plant dies. Another picture, picture of boron deficiency but then in tomatoes, the yellow uh, crowns. Um, of course, yeah, consumers don't like that because they think your tomatoes are already four or five weeks old uh, and they don't, uh, they're not tasty. A picture of a potassium deficiency in basil, so perhaps that's what uh, you were talking about. Potassium deficiency in tomato, there are several symptoms of that, but one of the main things is that the fruit, they don't color properly. Normally, the first fruit in the bunch starts coloring the fastest, because that was the first flower that was open, the first flower that was pollinated, and they uh, the flowers open in, in a sequence. So if you see that the last fruit is already turning orange, but the first fruit is not completely red yet, um, then you know that there's potassium deficiency. If there's not enough potassium in the, in, in the fruits, they cannot turn red properly. Uh, another symptom of potassium deficiency is the uh, necrosis or, um, well, yeah, dying off of the um, edges of the leaf and you can say okay why is this a problem because you don't lose a lot of photosynthesis uh, photosynthetic area in your plant but those dead edges of the leaves it's uh, a basis for fungi to grow on and then they will grow further on your healthy leaf and you, eventually your plant will die Calcium deficiency in tomato. You get these edges of the leaf, like they look, they've been in a, in a frying pan. Mm -hmm. um, calcium, this case of calcium deficiency was not because there was too few calcium near the roots. No, we had a, a spike of ammonia because we gave a lot of organic fertilizer. And calcium is a, a positive ion. 
uh, like uh, calcium two plus. If you give a lot of ammonia, NH four plus, you get antagonism between these uh, these nutrients. So it's not just a case of supplying all the things, but it has to be quite balanced because if you have an imbalance, you can also have deficiencies. It could happen in an aquaponic system. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's not, not only between ammonia and calcium, also for instance, magnesium. It's uh, magnesium 2 plus, you also get these, um, these interactions. Another uh, symptom of calcium deficiency in tomato you have these uh, yeah, tips of the fruits that turn black. It's also because there was not enough calcium in the cell walls, like I told you earlier. You get weak cell walls, and when the plant pushes water into the fruits, they, they, the cells burst. Um, nitrogen deficiency. In the beginning of the presentation, I showed you a picture of the uh, chlorophyll molecule with the nitrogen in there. If you don't have enough nitrogen, you get very pale leaves because there's not a lot of, of uh, chlorophyll in there. This is a plant with too few nitrogen in the back. Those, those very dark green leaves, those are plants with enough nitrogen. Of course, those plants can do more photosynthesis because they have more chlorophyll than these, these pale plants. Plants cannot take up all the nutrients uh, as effectively at every pH. Some of them are uh, better available at higher pH others at lower pH. So for instance, manganese is more available at a lower pH. Um, and, and iron also. And those are the main micronutrients that can give uh, deficiencies, although they are present in your nutrient solution, if the pH is too high. Um, I, normally it is advised for hydroponics to keep your pH at 5.6. I couldn't find a picture with the uh, <laughs> 5.6. Uh, here it's uh, 6 to 6.5, but what's clear is that it should be a little bit acidic. Uh, pH 7 is already quite high for iron availability and, uh, and manganese availability. So uh, try to keep it more at the, at the acidic side to make sure that the plant can take up all of the nutrients it needs. Um, then, if you have at your system and uh, there, there are some nutrients in there uh, in concentrations at which the, the plant cannot... No, well, I'll, I'll restart my sentence. Um, if you get accumulation of certain nutrients in your nutrient solution, uh, you can run into trouble. Uh, one of the reasons that you run into trouble is direct toxicity. For instance, copper, if there's too much copper in your nutrient solution, you'll really get toxic effects. Your leaves will start to uh, turn yellow. For most of the other elements, you don't get direct toxicity, but what happens is those, those uh, nutrients, those ions, start to compete with other ions for uptake by the plant. And this figure um, shows where there is antagonism uh, for the uptake. I already showed you the picture uh, earlier on with the calcium deficiency, which was caused by, by too much ammonium near the roots. So basically, all the positive ions, the cations, they compete with each other. All the negative ions, the anions, compete with each other. And then for the trace elements, it's uh, iron, manganese, and zinc, <laughs> copper, molybdenum, boron, and then silicium, uh, which is not actually um, essential for plants, silicium, but it helps them uh, build up resistance against diseases. And um, it, it might sometimes be a good idea to add it to a nutrient solution for hydroponics. For cucumbers, it can be a problem because you get a, a white hue on the cucumber, like there's a, a glazing on there, like a powder sugar. Uh, if you 
touch the cucumber to harvest it, your fingerprints are in there. It's not that attractive for consumers, but otherwise it doesn't harm the taste. For strawberries, you cannot use silicium because you have white strawberries. You get albino strawberries, that's something that, that they've seen in, in hydroponics. But there is some variety of white strawberries out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they are but, very, uh, very sweet, yeah, delicious. Yeah, but right. since you guys are not used to this, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so the accumulation of, accumulation of nutrients leads to problems. That's why you should make sure that your water sor source doesn't contain too much of certain uh, ions before you use it for aquaponics. Because one source of these nutrients is coming from the fish feed, but your water source can also contain some of them. Especially uh, copper, boron, uh, zinc, those things might be there in, uh, in too high levels. Also, if you're using um, well water, sodium can be there in, in, in too high concentrations. So, before you start running an aquaponic system at a, at a fairly large scale, let's say, it might be wise to send in a water sample. Uh, to get it analyzed and see what's present in the water. If you have a choice between well water and rainwater, for instance, or uh, rainwater and tap water, uh, might be interesting to, to get both analyzed and see what's best for your purpose. Um, then there's a, a potential, potentially big problem, the problem of sodium accumulation. So fish need sodium. Uh, all animals need sodium, but plants, they do not need it. Uh, so sodium is only taken up by plants in very low concentrations. Now when you keep on recycling this nutrient solution, uh, the sodium will start accumulating. Eventually, uh, it will lead to direct toxicity, but even before that, the sodium will contribute so much to the general electrical conductivity, the general EC in your root environment, that it will, will stop uh, water uptake and your, your plant will start to wilt just because of the amount of sodium near the roots. Do so you know what EC is? Sorry. Do you know what electrical conductivity is? Yeah? All of you? No? Maybe just two sentences about what it is? Um, electrical conductivity. Electrical <coughs> conductivity is a measure of how much ions are there present in the water. So, for instance, if you take demineralized water, the water that you use in, in chemical laboratories, um, it, it cannot transmit current because it's just H2O and there are no ions uh, dissolved in it. The more ions, the more nutrients in this case, you dissolve in that water, the better it can transmit uh, electrical current so the electrical conductivity rises and that's why we use it as a general measure for how much nutrients are present in the, in the water or how much uh, ions are present in the water. Here uh, I added a table with the thresholds for the, the input water, the, the water source for recirculating hydroponics. Um, there are different values for different crops. For instance, lettuce is quite, uh, quite susceptible to, to sodium, quite sensitive to it. Tomato is much less sensitive to it. These are values that I got from a book. They are uh, really low. I know that tomato growers, they only start worrying uh, in practice when they reach about um, to, uh, double this amount, like 1.5 uh, millimoles of, uh, of sodium in their water source. So let's say uh, 30 milligrams of sodium per liter is still okay for a water source, uh, but higher than that you're going to run into troubles when you keep on recirculating the water. Um, so sh sodium input should be minimal. First, from your fish feed, so choose a feed with the least amount of sodium uh, that's available for your fish species. And then the sodium concentration. Ah, okay, yeah, and then uh, the thing that we use to determine what should be the ratio 
between fish and plants is the sodium concentration in your wastewater. Um, we, we don't look at how much nitrate, for instance, is supplied by, by the fish feed. No, we look at how much sodium is, is supplied. We keep that at, at the, the minimum level uh, or the, the maximum level that we can use to recirculate the water and then all the other nutrients we add just by, by adding chemical fertilizers. And uh, if we look at our system with the omega purge and uh, the low sodium feed that we use, um, if we want to stay below this threshold of sodium, then we can use the wastewater to supply about 25% of the nutrient needs of our, uh, our tomato plants. All the other rest that we uh, we have to supply with chemical fertilizers, especially for the micronutrients, uh, iron, manganese, zinc, boron, copper, and molybdenum. There's very very few in, in our wastewater of the the RES system, so all of those we have to add ourselves. Um, this is of course for efficient production. I'm not saying that your plants will die if you, if you don't uh, supply these things extra. Here the micronutrients will, will be a, a problem in the end. And also this is for high quality production. I was already talking to some people here uh, in the room. You can grow tomatoes with less nutrients, but then they will take up a lot of water. You get big fruits, a lot, uh, many kilos of tomatoes, but the taste of those tomatoes Will, will be very bland. Mm -hmm. uh, there will not be much sugar in the tomato, so it's better to keep the EC higher, nutrient levels higher, and then you get high quality production. Um, because of these nutrients have to be added, we cannot recirculate the water back to the fish, of course, and that's why we have a decoupled system. There's wastewater coming uh, from the fish, going to the tomato plants, but it's not going back. We recirculate the water again with the tomato plants. That means, of course, that the, the amount of water that we can refresh in our RAS system has to be uh, balanced to the amount of water that our tomato plants can evaporate or can transpire because there's no other way of getting water out of that system. Um, so, if we take into account this evaporation rate of the tomato plants, then uh, we calculate that a 10 hectare tomato uh, greenhouse could be combined with a 250 tons jade perch or media perch uh, fish farm. Um, for carbon dioxide research, I, I added a slide because sometimes in literature you read about uh, the use of, of carbon dioxide coming from the fish uh, by the plants for photosynthesis. <coughs> Definitely in, in um, temperate climates where during large part of the days the greenhouse vents can be closed to uh, save energy, to, to uh, save the heat, um, and the plants are doing photosynthesis, they use up most of the carbon dioxide in the greenhouse quite quickly. If you don't have carbon dioxide, your photosynthesis rate goes down. Uh, 350 ppm of carbon dioxide, that's about what we have in the um, atmosphere, in the outside air. If the plants uh, use up carbon dioxide, your rate of photosynthesis for the same amount of light um, <coughs> goes down, but also uh, if you increase the amount of carbon dioxide higher than we have, have in the outside atmosphere, your photosynthesis rate goes up and you also can use more light. So in, in commercial greenhouses we try to keep the carbon dioxide levels at at least 800 ppm um, during the daytime. Now, an RAS system produces about 550 grams of carbon dioxide for every 
kilogram of feed that you add. It depends, of course, on the protein content because a lot of those carbon dioxide is coming from the bacteria in your biofilter. Um, you could use that carbon dioxide in your greenhouse, but keep in mind that if you put your fish tanks inside the greenhouse, you also raise the humidity because you have evaporation of water coming from your, uh, from your fish tanks. <coughs> And you have to get rid of the humidity, which is an ener energy intensive process, uh, as I already told you. If you open the vents in the greenhouse, you will lose that extra carbon dioxide in, in a way, and you come back to the, the concentration in, in the atmosphere. So I don't think there's a big advantage in doing that. I just wanted to add, <coughs> add this slide because you find some information on that in, uh, in literature. If you have so, so you suggest to separate the, the, yeah. the greenhouse, to have a greenhouse for the fish and one greenhouse for the, for the plants? Yeah, uh, or no greenhouse for the fish with a very well isolated room, something like that. Container. Yeah, a container. Um, That's for your climate. For our climate, yeah. In drier, warmer climate, like the Mediterranean. Would there, be there a different is scenario. Be, uh, Maybe it's good to have the fish there giving the moisture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it will also give some evaporative cooling to to your um, to your greenhouse. Um, talking a little bit about light, I just added one slide because it's such a complex story. Uh, plants use light for for two things. It's photosynthesis. And there you have the photosynthetic active radiation part, light, which has peaks mostly in the blue region and in the red region. That's, that's, that are the wavelengths that plants can use most efficiently for, uh, for photosynthesis. If you want to buy LEDs, a lot of manufacturers of LEDs will show you this picture and say, yeah, we have uh, LEDs with with uh, only blue light and only red light and it's, it's optimal for photosynthesis. And that's true, but plants also use light for the control of a lot of complex physiological and morphological processes. And the way that plants use those or the combination of wavelengths that they need, it differs quite a lot between, um, between plant species. There is still a lot of research that needs to be done uh, on that. And um, I would advise you to be, to be very careful when selecting a light source. It's also much easier to grow plants under sunlight and then give them additional uh, power light than grow them in a completely dark room. And you would have to supply them with all the wavelengths that they also need for, for proper uh, physiological <coughs> function. Is it the last step? The last step, sorry. The light is the last step when you are yeah. control everything? Yeah, I, I would say so, yeah. And also carbon dioxide for sure, because I, um, I have this, I had this experience like two weeks ago. I went to a grower, a young guy who wanted starting growing, started growing, wanted to, wanted to start growing. Um, and I visited him also six months ago and I told him, yeah, those are the possibilities. You have uh, humidity control, uh, heating, cooling, um, and carbon dioxide supplementation and lighting. And the first thing that he put his money in was carbon dioxide supplementation, but all the other things were, were not into place yet. And it cost him thousands of euros and he actually can't do anything with it. Should have prioritized the list, but mm. I, think wow. awesome. yeah. I thought he, <laughs> he would know it by himself. Mm -hmm. uh, reliable uh, companies for energy lighting? Yeah, the, the large ones like Philips, uh, Fiona, Valoya, those are, uh, those, those are quite reliable. They have big research institutes. Uh, Behind them, Lemnis is also one. They have uh, water-cooled LEDs. Their LEDs are quite good, and 
still a little bit hesitating about uh, the water cooling because you can spring leaks and, and things like that. Those are the, the companies that do a lot of research. And then we also have a lot of other companies uh, coming in with LEDs produced in China. And, and there's nothing wrong with producing things in China, but you have to do some research on efficiency. Give the right data to, for growing them. Yeah, it's, it's very hard to obtain the complete spectrum for LEDs from the manufacturers. There are uh, different research institutes that, that can measure them for you. Um, we have a sister research station. I work at the research station for vegetables. We also have one for ornamentals and they have all this equipment for measuring uh, out LEDs. Uh, I suppose there should be one in every country. If you're thinking about investing in LEDs, just contact them and they can measure out all the different different LED fixtures. Uh, quick words about the importance of genetics and breeding. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the advantages of using F1 hybrids or, or uh, stable lines of, of vegetable. If you're growing in a hydroponic system and especially in a substrate system where uh, the, all the plants are supplied with an individual dripper, it's important that every plant is growing at the same speed, uh, is growing optimum at the same tem temperature, at the same relative humidity, otherwise it's very hard to get the climate optimal. With uh, F1 hybrids, you have all the plants that are exactly the same uh, in your system. And then, one of the things uh, that's, that's uh, also important when you select seeds, is you look at disease resistances. Uh, especially if you don't want to use uh, chemical pesticides in, in your system, you have to look at disease resistances. If you look, go on the websites of all the major seed companies, and unfortunately mm -hmm. they have all been bought by the, the big chemical companies, Monsanto, Syngenta, Bayer, they're all buying the, the good seed companies. Anyway, they're... Uh, Resistance information is all uh, on, on the websites for each variety and you should look at the varieties that have the most resistances or at least resistances against the diseases that you have problems with. For instance, BL is a code for Brenia lactocai. It's a downy mildew of, of lettuce and all the numbers behind it are the races of this disease that is uh, resistant against. So you should also look at the, the varieties which has the most numbers behind uh, its name. Um, this one is also highly resistant to pemphigus, it's a root aphid of, of lettuce, and, um, and the normal, uh, normal uh, green lettuce of uh, green aphid lettuce. This is highly resistant. This is intermediate resistance. So this means that this disease cannot be present on the plant. Here, the disease can be present, but at a lower rate than a than a non resistant uh, uh, variety. LMV is a lettuce mosaic virus, and then one is race one of the of the virus. Um, also, on the websites of the seed companies, there are lists what these codes just mean uh, when you're selecting resistant varieties. And then, of course, buy quality and disease-free seeds. If you buy uh, F1 hybrids from, from these big seed companies, they are, have all been tested uh, to be disease-free. If you start reproducing your own seeds, not only will you lose the uh, homogeneity or the uniformity of, of F1 hybrids, but there's also a risk of carrying over diseases like Fusarium or, or several viruses uh, with the seeds that, that you collect yourself. Um, and I had a couple of words on, on pests and diseases, but this is essentially the same triangle that Adrian also uh, yeah. showed. The difference is with, uh, with the plants, we have much more resistances against diseases. 
There have been a plant breeding for, for almost a thousand years, selecting resistant varieties. That's something that we don't have yet with fish. We only started really breeding fish uh, for a couple of decades and then only in, in salmon uh, trout and the, the major species, but, but, but not for the smaller species. So if you want to uh, prevent diseases and pests, first look at, at the resistant varieties. And yeah, that's where I, I want to give the word, conclude. Yeah, but if there are any questions, feel free. If you don't, do. thank you.